Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today we have a very special guest who devoted 20 years of his life living and working with the incomparable superstar Doris Day. He started out in England as a devoted fan, but after meeting Miss Day and developing a friendship with her, she convinced him to come to America to work for her. He was a jack of all trades. He cared for her pets, cleaned her house, did her gardening, took care of her pool, and even helped dye her hair. He helped her move from Beverly Hills to her beloved home in Carmel, California, where he witnessed many changes in her life and was a constant source of support and comfort to her. Theirs was much more than an employment relationship. They were best friends who relied and depended on each other during good times and bad. He's just released a sentimental and nostalgic book entitled To Doris with Love from Woody Day, My Days with Doris Day. I'm delighted to welcome Sid Wood to our show. He's joined by his partner, Scott Wood. Sid and Scott, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, wonderful. You're welcome. It's good to speak to you. Sid, why did you decide to write the book? Well, basically, of over a number of years, he's told stories. People have found out that he worked for Doris, and they were fascinated by the stories he was telling. And always oh, said, why don't you put it into a book? And he always said he would not write a book until Doris had passed away. And then he would write the book and he stuck to that. And once she was gone, he decided he would write the book. Sid, why did you want to wait until she died before you put the book out? Because I used to run the fan club in England and I kind of got to know what people are like. You know, some people could really be nasty and ask some ugly questions. And he didn't want her to have to take the brunt of it while she was alive in case, you know, there was people saying nasty things. So he figured if she was gone, you know, she wouldn't have to be subjected to it. What is there nasty to say about Doris Day? No, nothing. I think a lot of people were jealous. A lot of people didn't understand her. And I think they just, you know, wanted to cause trouble. But on the other hand, I knew a lot of people that really, really loved the lady. Now, your name is Sydney Wood, but the title of your book refers to you as Woody Day. Where did that name come from? Oh, that was Terry Melcher. <laughs> we got on fabulous, Terry and I. He, he would come to the, the property on Doris's. And she was, you know, quite some way from the... At main road but uh, you always knew when he was at the front gate because he would start Woody, Woody calling me to come and open the gates for him it, it, he always had a name for me always had a different name for me i understand he called you woody because he named you after ron wood of the rolling stones Mm -hmm. That was one of the reasons. I think that was the first thing you thought of because he spent a lot of time with Ron Wood anyway. And he was a good friend to him. So when I come along with the same name, I think he, he liked that because he could spread it out a bit more. You were an avid Doris Day fan, even as a child. When you were a youngster in England, you and three friends formed a group that came to be known around the world as the Doris Day Society. And in 1970, you launched a quarterly newsletter called the Doris Day Society Journal. What was it about Doris Day's movies and records that fascinated you so much, Sid? I, I don't know. My mother loved the movies. And every time there was a movie out, she would take me. And if there was a Doris Day movie out, I had to go at the very first showing, screening. And I, I guess I came away loving the woman because of her, the way she spoke, which was really, you know, one of a kind. And her singing. I mean, no one can improve on Doris Day. No one. That's for sure. Now, in 1973, Doris Day came to London with her friend Jacqueline Suzanne. You met her for the first time in the lobby of the Dorchester Hotel. Can you tell us about that first meeting, Sid? Yeah, I, I didn't know she was there for a start. And I was working. I was in photography at the time. And I could have been delivering some, some photographs or something or other. And... I came back and I just looked in the hotel and she was sitting at a table. And I didn't know Jacqueline Suzanne, but Jacqueline Suzanne was doing all the talking. 
so I knew she was American. And then I just went in and uh, naturally I saw her once in full close up who she was. And we got on really, really well. I never went back to work. I stayed there till about five, six o'clock, just talking, just, just talking. And so there was that, that strange connection there. <clears throat> How did you end up working for Doris? That time she came over, the two girls said to her that, you know, they would be going over to America. The two girls that helped me with the fan club, Sheila Smith and Valerie Andrews. And Sheila had uh, relatives in New York, so she would come over there, you know, quite regularly, vacation. So they came over during that. Doris said, come and see me. And they went and they stayed there for much longer than they needed to. And they helped with the dogs. They helped with the cleaning. They just took care of her. They took her shopping. She was, they were companions to her. And I think that's something that she never had. She really just had hangers on. So they took the job. She said she'd like them to work for her. They took the job, which was, you know, cleaning, the, taking care of the animals and just shopping and taking care of Dora's day. And then how did you come to work for her? Uh, Sheila said to me, Sid, why don't you take a couple of weeks off and come over? You'll like it over here. And I never even thought about it, let alone could afford the fare. So I big student borrowed and bought a ticket came over. I stayed with the girls in their cottage on Doris Day's property in Beverly Hills. And during the time I had nothing to do, much, you know, apart from on the girls' days off. And I would weed the garden. I would sweep the garden. I'd pick up all the leaves. I'd take care of the dogs. I would uh, clean the pool get all the leaves out the pool. I just, I just took everything just to keep busy. And when I guess I left, Doris noticed it. Yeah. She would come out and sit by the pool and just sit there and read a book and, you know, while I'd be sort of cleaning out all the leaves. The day I was coming, coming back, as it were, she said, Sid, and I said, yeah. She said, why don't you think about coming to work earlier? She said, you've got the girls as your friend. You wouldn't be on your own. And uh, she said, give it a thought. She said, I, I'd employ you immediately. What so did you think I, about that? I think I was shocked. I think I was too shocked to have an emotion, you know. I had my mum and dad, and they were getting up there in years. So I explained all that to her, that I couldn't do that, but I could come over for a few months. And that's how it happened in the beginning. Now, you worked for Doris Day for a total of almost 20 years, first from 1979 to 1992, and then again from 2000 to 2004. You lived in the gatehouse at her spectacular home in Carmel, and you cared for her 18 dogs. But at one point, she had as many as 50 dogs. How in the world did you manage to care for all those dogs? <laughs> Well, there was times when there was about 50 on the property, but they didn't stay there all day because a couple of her other workers um, would take them down to a, a pet foundation in Beverly Hills. So they didn't, they didn't stay overnight, but they, they used to come up so that Doris could play with them. It was exciting. It really, really was exciting. And, and they were all strays. They were ones that that she just found and picked up. People would phone her up. And she was in Beverly Hills one, one morning and two men come running out of the shop. I don't know what the shop was. Could have been a bank, whatever. But they had a gun in their hand and they jumped in a truck and ran off. And in the truck was a... a big dog. I, I don't know the breed, but uh, his name is Barney. Uh, she named him Barney. And they caught up to the, the police car. And uh, of course, Doris took the dog and took it home. So when I got there, Barney, Barney was, was my friend. 
you know, he was always with me. <clears throat> it's just amazing. Tell us about Doris's personality. You said in the book that she was an exceptionally nice person, but she could have an icy side to her personality. What did you mean by that, Sid? What was icy about her? Maybe icy was a bit strange, but it's probably what I had at, at the time. If if she didn't agree with something and and that and you know that was fine that was all right you know we would just carry on with our work but sometimes I would say something and you could tell she disapproved of it so you changed the subject you know it could have been anything it could have been just grooming the dog uh, taking care of the dogs feeding the dogs silly silly stuff really but um, you knew when she'd had enough you you, you know she, she had a a fabulous personality. Everybody, everybody loved it. But there were there were some shady sides where she wanted to be alone. I think I got on well with her because I left her alone. I didn't go running to her with questions and answers all the time. I just got on and did it. And I think she knew that that I, I wouldn't sort of pry. Did you ever discuss with her the reason why she retired from show business so young? I don't think so. No, I didn't. No, I would never have done that anyway. I think she'd had enough of Marty at the time. And I think she probably decided that, that she'd done all she wanted to do, not do it because someone else wanted her to do it, you know, because he signed her to every contract that came in. Her husband, Martin Melcher. Yes. Yeah. But then um, he, he died. He did. Yes. So she could have been in show business without him after he died. Yeah, well, she did. She come back on Best, best Friends. Terry talked her into doing Best Friends, which she loved to do because it was animals. And probably people didn't find a show which included animals. I'm sure if she had that, she would still be doing it today, you know? Yeah, she enjoyed doing her TV show about animals. That's right. Yeah. They meant everything to her. Um, I think she liked animals more than people. A lot of men, a lot of people, yes. She wasn't strict with the dogs or anything. She always made a fuss of them. Um, with Biggest, he was always the, the, the babe, you know, always the one. And she'd always put her arms around his neck and kiss him, and he would, he would just lap it up. I mean, you know, <laughs> he was up to a good thing. Did she ever talk about her movies and her singing career? No, not in depth. No. I would be out in the garden and I'd be sort of doing the grounds and whatever, and I'd always be whistling a song or I'd always be singing something. And then if I come into the house, she would always be including one of those songs in her repertoire while she was in the kitchen feeding the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> so did she sing around the house? Yes, yes. She'd always, you know, always hum a tune, not as though she was in, in front of a, mo a microphone singing, but she would, she would hit out a tune, yes, yes. Did she ever watch any of her movies? Did you ever see her watching TV with her movies on them? No, not really. She watched some of her best friends, the TV show that she did. Not all of them, but there were little things that she had to catch up on that she would spend time in front of the television. No, she loved all the talk uh, shows that, that was on. on did TV. she ever play her records? No, never. No. But at least you got to hear her sing around the house. That must have been amazing. Oh, yeah. She'd always come down the stairs, la, 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 ring. And, and, yeah. <laughs> so, Sid, do you have a favorite Doris Day movie? I guess Calamity Jane, because I was a child at the time. And, and that is a child's picture. She was a lot like Calamity. I mean, a lot like Calamity. Now, I understand you got to meet some of Doris's celebrity friends. Let's start with Betty White, who also had a home in Carmel. What was Betty White like? I, the only times I really, really <laughs> met her was when I would go to the gate and let her come onto the property. There was one time I went up to her house to take her something that Doris had packaged for her. And uh, 
she wouldn't let me leave. She came out and sat on the porch. She wrapped her arms around the porch post and she glued herself for as long as I would stay there. She was a lovely, lovely lady. And she was at a tissue in her sleeve, you mm. said? Yeah, when, when she come to the property, I would open the gate for her and she would thank me and she would make me get into the passenger so she could drive me down to the, the circle. So she, she wanted you to take her from the gatehouse to the front door? Oh, yes. She'd never go down on her own. No, she wanted me to, to take her down. And she always had a paper handkerchief in her, in her sleeve, in her wrist. And very, very feminine lady. Very feminine. She was adorable. Now, in 1983, Doris and Rock Hudson were talking about making a sequel to Pillow Talk, but it never got made. Did you ever find out why they never made that movie? I don't think Doris wanted to do it, to be honest. You know, I don't think someone could come up with a, a good script for the thing. And it just got forgotten. You know, Rock would still come up for a few days. And, you know, they'd go out to lunch. And that's what the friendship was. It was never to work again. But I'm sure if someone had a project at that time, they would have done it because they were in the mood for it, you know. Rock Hudson appeared on Doris's TV show, Best Friends, in 1985, shortly before he died of AIDS. He looked very, very ill at the time. Did Doris ever talk to you about her feelings for Rock and how she dealt with his death? No, never. No, she would never discuss his illness with anyone. And I never asked. I, I would I would I would never approach the subject because I know how bad it affected her. <clears throat> Doris also received a visit from Paul McCartney and he telephoned her often to chat. Did you ever get to meet him? Yes, he was fun. She has a at the back of the uh, the property was the ch dog's area, of course, and the kennels and whatever. And there was a field that went down. And when he came, he was at the top of the, the incline of the grassy field. And, uh, and he, was, he was, yeah, Woody, yeah, Woody. <laughs> he, 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 was, he was fantastic. He really, really was. He was really fun. I, I enjoyed meeting him. I know that Doris was very good friends with John Denver. Is it true that she was supposed to have dinner with him on the very night that he died in that plane crash? Yes, he had come up to town and he had spent a couple of days business-wise and he spent a lot of time at the house taking her to dinner and, and that it affected her heavy because uh, she was on his doorstep you know, most of the time. They were very good friends, very good friends, always laughing. If you can imagine Doris with her giggle and, uh, and him, it, it was good. Now, I understand that her son Terry was very close with the Beach Boys and that you watched them write their number one song, Kokomo, in your bedroom with John Phillips from the Mamas and the Papas. Tell us about that, Sid. That's just amazing. Yeah, that's true. When, when Terry was in town. He would live in his house, you know, with his wife and son. And then sometimes he'd bring his son up. And if it was my day off, he'd come up into my apartment and he'd just open up and just be a normal person, you know. He would do a lot, a lot of writing and things like that. And um, he, he obviously had a good time because he used to do it quite often. In your apartment? Yes, yeah. So what was it like seeing him and John Phillips from the Mamas and the Papas writing a number one hit song, Kokomo? Did you know I didn't really think much of it at the time? Not that I, I sat down and dwelled on it, but they were busy and, and I was doing my business with, with Doris's problems. Um, so I wasn't there all the time. But it was a haven for them to sort of, you know, be away from the, the normal working area that they, they had. They, they did a lot of work there. They, they came there quite often. 
Did Doris Day change a lot after her son Terry passed away in 2004? Not an awful lot. She was still that strong woman that took care of things. But you knew that it affected her. You, you, just, you just, you know, it, 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 it showed. But she didn't show it, you know. She must have been incredibly strong. Yes, she, she could be. She could be. I, I think when you think of the early days of Hollywood, she was surrounded by strong people. All the actors and others at that time, they all had their opinion and they would only do what they wanted to do. But her son was her only family and he died so young. Yes. Yeah. That, that was, a, a, well, you naturally you know that it was a huge shock. But she had her dogs, you see. She had her dogs. And they gave her comfort. Yes. Yes. You know, when you've got 11 dogs running around you, you don't have time to think of anything else, but where is the 10 gone? <laughs> In 1989, Sid, you accompanied Doris to Hollywood to receive the Cecil B. DeMille Award at the Golden Globes. Tell us about that experience. Doris was surrounded by all the Hollywood people. You know, she couldn't avoid them. Some people that she loved and spent years with and others that she didn't know but she treated them all the same i understand that in the car going to hollywood she asked you for advice on what to say in her acceptance speech <laughs> yes <laughs> mm -hmm. she was saying you know i don't know what i'm gonna say I, I, it's different when people ask you questions you can give them an answer and i said well You've worked with the best of Hollywood. I said, look at the names that you've worked with. And I said, why don't you just say you, you, you had the cream of the crop, you know, because that's what you, you worked with. And she didn't say yes, she didn't say no, but she showed up saying yes. <laughs> so that came from you. Yes, yeah. Now, you mentioned speaking to the media. I know that in 2012, Sid, you spoke to the media and you expressed concern about Doris's well-being. You said that you were worried she wasn't surrounded by good people. What exactly were your concerns? Well, I, I'll explain that one. We had gotten a phone call because somebody had gotten a, my email address online and a lady had called. She said she was a nurse and a fan of Doris's, and she had called us and said that she was concerned about Doris because she said she had called the house and she had gotten Doris's private number somehow. And she had something she wanted to do with the Animal Foundation. And Doris answered the phone, but she had a bad cold. And Dor she was telling Doris about it, the uh, things she wanted to do. And somebody saw Doris talking on the phone and in the background, she heard somebody say, why are you on the phone? You know, you're not allowed to talk long distance and took the phone away from Doris and hung up. And the lady was very upset by that and tried to call back. And it just kept ringing and ringing and she could never get through again. And she figured that Sid working there for so many years would be able to do something about it. but you know, he couldn't because he didn't, you know, know anybody at that point that could do anything. So, you know, he tried to get in touch with whoever he could, but at that point, you know, it was so many years gone by. And so that's why he said that in the uh, interview. I see. I, th I think in, in the later days when there was none of the normal people around, I don't know whether a different agencies sent different people to take care of her. Uh, that I don't know. But there was one woman that was really snappy and she only wanted Doris to do what she wanted her to do. But I didn't know her name. I didn't know where she came come from and I wouldn't recognize her. Well, I just want to say that the people that I have interviewed about Doris Day have assured me that she got very good care a great deal of love and support and a lot of sincerity in her final years. 
and her final days. Well, I never knew anybody at that end, so I have no comment to, to say on that. But I can imagine, I mean, you know, you had to. She was that type of woman that you just want to cuddle all the time. Now, she passed away on May 13th, 2019. How have you dealt with her passing, Sid? Uh, I can deal with it now. I can talk about it. I guess for about six or eight weeks, I didn't want to hear any music. I didn't want to hear any voice. I just wanted to shut away. It, it was difficult, but I could easily pick out the good times, you know, the, the fun times we had. <clears throat> Now, Sid, you've told me privately that you think there may be people out there who will criticize you for writing a book about your relationship with Doris. What do you want to say to those people? There's already been somebody who's already been criticizing the fact that he put a book out. And, you know, everybody else has been telling Sid to ignore it because there's always going to be somebody out there who is going to be critical. and. I guess what, what exactly are they criticizing him for? They said they're saying basically that he's a leech and that he's one of those people that, you know, everybody writes a book about Doris and, you know, when she's gone and they're trying to profit off of her. But the thing is, they don't realize because they did not live with her for 20 years and they don't know the relationship. and. Sid has never said a bad word about Doris. So, you know, they really can't, they don't have any basis for anything. So, you know, they can say what they want, but there's no facts, you know? Well, Sid, I want to thank you for writing the book and giving us another window into the life of Doris Day and helping us to know more about who she really was. I wish you the best of luck with the book. And I want to thank you both so much for coming on our show. That's good. I had a good time. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Um, just thinking about it makes you feel uh, different. You know what I mean? It's, it's, uh, it's a good feeling. Well, thank you very much. I think that people who are real fans of Doris will enjoy your book. Our guest yes. has been Sid Wood, author of To Doris With Love from Woody Day, My Days with Doris Day, along with his partner, Scott Wood. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.